auras. You don't have to see them, you don't have to feel them, but you need to know how to use them to help you live your best life. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is author Dimitri Moriatis. We're going to talk about auras right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California, Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and we're on UK Health Radio all weekend long. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, the interview portion of our show, and today we're going to talk about auras. You know, everything you think, feel, and do radiates a spiritual energy that comes through in various colors and hues. And this is your aura, your spiritual blueprint. By changing the quality of your aura, which you can do, you can change the quality of your life. And I've got one of the two world's experts on auras on the show today. And whether you see your auras or not, renowned clairvoyant known as the Mozart of metaphysics, physics, Barbara Y. Martin, who recently passed, constructed and created the whole practice around, uh, around auras with her partner, Dimitri Moriatis. They've led thousands of people through a highly effective technique for meditating with divine light to access the auric power that's necessary to improve your aura and generate change. Through their nonprofit called the Spiritual Arts Institute, which is in, I believe, Encinitas, California, right down the road from me, they've been teaching these techniques to thousands of students all over the world for decades. And they have the seminal book on auras. There's a lot of book on auras, but this is the one. Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, a step-by-step -step guide to unfolding your spiritual power by Barbara Y. Martin and Dimitri Moriatis. And Dimitri Moriatis is my guest today, a return guest on Guys Guys Radio to talk about the 20th anniversary and third printing of the book. So welcome back to Guys Guys Radio, Dimitri. Well, thank you for having me on again. I remember when we were talking last time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, we've had a couple of conversations. First, I want to mention uh, Barbara Y. Martin recently passed right before her 95th birthday and the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the re-release of the book. And she's really been uh, at the forefront of auric mm -hmm. science, if you quote unquote science, if you will. Well, how about a little uh, uh, background, yeah. a little tribute to Barbara, because she does Great. so much wonderful work with you, Dimitri. Yeah, yeah. She is truly one of the pioneers in metaphysics her and people like her with they didn't do their trailblazing work when it wasn't so popular as it is today we probably wouldn't be having conversations like this right it's always sort of the generation she was part of the greatest generation my god her oldest brother fought in world war ii with Patton's third army so that's kind of the world that she came from uh she was born one of six children uh her father was a greek orthodox priest and he was also a builder of churches so they would send him around the country physically build the church, get the congregation together, and then boom, off they were to somewhere else. Uh, when finally they came to California to build the church in Pasadena, uh, the mother and the family fell in love with California. This was during the golden age of Hollywood. and said, okay, you go wherever the church sends you. The family is staying here from now on, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what happened. But even as a little girl, she said as early as three years old, she was starting to see auras, but she didn't know what, what it was. She just knew wow, this person has some really interesting energies around them, or, oh, this is kind of scary. Uh, and then she got in trouble because, you know, she would talk about her experiences and the others didn't understand what was going on, you know, and there was no books in those days and things like that. When she was 11 and they were in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, she was in a theater company, you know, performing, even as a little kid. And the, the, the director there called her in privately one time and basically said to her, you can see the aura, can't you? And her jaw dropped. She said, is that what it's called? You know, she didn't even have a name for it. And she said, I can see the aura too. I'm a hermetic scientist. My mother, grandmother, they're both hermetic scientists. I'd like to teach you about your gifts. So that's where Barbara started learning about the auric colors, what they meant and how to interpret. Then when they came to California, she was initially going into the showbiz world and it was kind of moving very well for her. But right when she had this opportunity to kind of really build it up, the the inspiration came in, no, this is not your destiny. You're meant to be a metaphysical teacher, which she accepted. Um, it wasn't an easy road. She then met another great mystic that really trained her to be a teacher. Now, this other mystic, Inez, she taught very privately, 
but she told Barbara, no, you're not, you're going to go to the public platform. You're going to teach this to many other people. And at the time, again, she didn't think that was going to really fly, but when she got her first call to actually for a paid workshop on the aura, she dropped the phone. She didn't think, do you have the right number <laughs> kind of a thing? And then it launched this amazing career. Um, I met her, I came to California from movies uh, and it was actually going pretty well. Uh, but I was having these just, I call them at the time, my inspiration moments. They were sort of this heightened awareness kind of came like the wind and left like the wind. And it got so strong, I had my spiritual awakening, and I was really delving into it. I kind of really jumped into it. Uh, and about a year later, I met Barbara at a dinner party. And after one evening, I knew she was my teacher, you know. And then so we started she started teaching right away. But then we also knew we liked to write. And at the time, she didn't have anything, no books or no even course notes, nothing. It was all oral. So then... After a while, we decided we got to we got to organize all these teachings. And the first book was the Change Your Aura. And that kind of launched the Institute, launched all the programs to try to build now. And of course, the goal is to keep this legacy going and growing. So it's, the book is based on a lifetime of experiences. We say 50, 60 years of clairvoyant study. And it's it's a beautiful book. Um, it's got so many great illustrations. I'm just holding it up for our YouTube and Rumble viewers. There's so much to work with with the book and it's a chock full of information yeah. about your chakras and uh, chakras and your aura, et cetera. But let's talk about, you mentioned something, your spiritual awakening and uh, talk to us about that. What is the importance of uh, spiritual work in one's life? And what was your, what happened for you personally with your spiritual awakening? Yeah. Well, you know, some people would look at things like the aura and say, you're nuts. There's no such thing as an aura, right? So we, we, we have the, Sometimes you call them the believers and the non-believers. But what's really happening is, and I'm sure many people watching your show, they've had some type of inner prompting. Something has told them through their own experience that there's something more than just this physical world and atoms and energy floating around. There's something bigger going on here. Now, we may not always understand what it is, but it becomes a calling, right? When I had my awakening, it was... It was like falling in love with somebody, but deeply. So it wasn't really almost like a choice. I just felt compelled to do this in a very joyful way. Uh, and so, you know, you can't command an awakening. It sort of has to happen. But what we tell people, if you've had that prompting, now, for me, it was dramatic and quick. For some, it happens over a long period of time. Maybe they're showing interest in things or kind of curious or delving. But then even then, there's sometimes a, a turning point. They say, you know what? I got to do something about this. So what we tell people is if you've had your awakening, that's not an accident. That's the divine knocking on your door. And it's your job to walk through that door and pursue it. It's going to lead you to extraordinary things. And even if people around you did not have the awakening, it's okay. Don't try to change them. My mistake when I had my awakening is I was so excited. I was sharing everybody about it. You know, I grew up in Chicago and in the area in California, my friends and family, you know, I think he's been in LA too long. It's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't, and Barbara would say, Shh, just tone it down a little bit. But I, after a while, I realized she was right. You know, okay, it's not the same for everybody. And you're not supposed to try to change everybody. You can share certain things, but if they're ready, they're ready. If they're not, they're not. But if you've had it, you've got to do something about it. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Uh, we're kind of all headed to the same destination, but everybody's route is a little bit different. So yeah. when 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 you get your awakening, sometimes it can be frustrating with other people that you know or old friends, whatever you see, they they seem different or like they don't get this or and it's not really about that. And it's very easy for us to get into a position where we're like, oh well, I know this now, and then you get judgy with other people, and that's really not what it's all about. A spiritual no, awakening not. is about really being present and being understanding and exactly. being aware exactly. and witnessing and not and responding and not reacting and and not judging there's a time for everything under the sun right as the bible says so if it's your time great what does shakespeare say to thine own self be true and you cannot be false to anyone mm -hmm. and if it's not your time then it's not and the goal is love your family all the more your friends or whatever but be true to you and the ones that are going to be true, they'll stay with you. You know, this will not be the, the 
But sometimes, and Barbie used to say this, don't be surprised if as you're kind of growing in your life, people that were very important in your life at one point may not be so much, but then other people start coming into your life. And you do want to try to find your brothers and sisters in life. One of the most beautiful things of, of having an organization like this is it brings a fellowship together. You know, we're sharing in the same thing. We're a community. And communities are very supportive and encouraging. And you, you want that because the journey is not always easy. That's true. My special guest on Guys Guys Radio return guest, Dimitri Moreitis. We're talking about change your aura, change your life. So let's get right to it, Dimitri. What exactly is the aura and how does it differ from like divine light? A lot of people think an aura is an energetic field that goes out about a couple of feet outside each person's body or each being's body. It could be around a person, an animal. I was wondering, could it be around the ocean? Could it be around a tree? What, is, what exactly is an aura? Well, actually, aura is composed of spiritual energy. So what happens is um, it takes energy to do anything. So we have three different definitions we use for the aura. Number one, a vibratory essence that surrounds all living things. So you're rating in energy, I'm rating in energy, because we're, it, we're, we're alive and we're vibrating with power. It's also been called the energetic blueprint of the soul. So we all are, we are not our body. We are a soul inhabiting a body. But that soul needs fuel. It needs fuel to express itself and do the things it needs to do. And the spiritual power of your aura is that fuel. And then a third definition, which is very related to what you just brought up, is it's the, in, the aura is the individual expression of the universal life force. Meaning, the auric powers are expressing didn't come from us, they're coming through us. And a good way to express this is, say, let's say I'm a very creative person. I'm, I'm a painter and I'm really deep into my art. Well, I'm going to be attracting spiritual energies related to that, which could be the powder blue ray, the, the electric blue of talent and all of this, because that's how I'm utilizing the life force. Now, if I'm a scientist, I may be using a lot of the mental powers, a lot of the silver, a lot of the lemon yellow. I've got to hold all these calculations in my mind and make sense of all of this. So that's going to come in through different energies. So no two auras are alike because we're not going to use the life force the same way. The challenge is, though, as that power is coming in, it will either be amplified if we use it with a purpose intended, or it can start to diminish and change colors, and we call it become unenlightened. So, for example, if I'm bringing in a lot of, if I'm expressing a lot of love, that the energy comes in as a beautiful deep rose pink. But if I start getting angry and mad and hateful, that energy is going to start to corrupt itself. And it's going to come through as this dirty, ugly energy. One of the things Barbara shared is it wasn't always pleasant seeing auras because sometimes she'd look at her parents arguing and she could see the discordant energy moving between it was far more beyond than just sound. So you're rating right now an energy corresponding to the quality of your thinking, your feeling, the things you're doing right this minute. We're never stuck with an aura the way it is. You can change it. And the idea is to what? Improve it. So can uh, how many folks can actually see auras? Not uh, Can you see your aura? And can you see your aura in the mirror? And how can people start to be aware of seeing auras on other people and other beings that we come across? I mean, can you see people's auras the same way Barbara did? Well, okay, let, let's back on what you said at the beginning. The book is not about seeing auras, okay? Seeing auras is a byproduct of our spiritual evolution. Okay. It's about working with the auric power. So in other words, also getting the sense, we all have what we call intuition. Some of us pay attention to it, some of us do not. Intuition, from our understanding, is not an emotion, it's not a thought, it's not an instinct. It is a prompting of your spiritual senses. We all have them. Just not all of us have them awakened. So let's say you you walk into a room and you just it's an it's an ordinary looking room, but you feel wonderful when you walk in there. And you're going, I don't know why I feel so good here. Well, there could be an, an, an amazing energy in that room. You may not be clairvoyantly seeing it, but in a sense you are, your senses are picking it up and it's giving you this elating feeling. Then you could walk into a palace and feel 
like a blood curdling chill up your spine and say, why the heck am I feel? Look at this place is beautiful, but it, I feel awful in here because maybe there's an awful energy in there. You're not seeing it clairvoyantly, but in a sense you are, and you're picking that up. So, you know, we, the sixties was all about, Hey, I like that person's vibe, or I don't like that person's vibe. No, but there was truth in that because we are radiating this and we're supposed to pay attention to the intuition. Now, as far as working with it, all right, if you do study the aura and you learn like, for example, anger comes through as a vitiated red, a dirty, dark red energy. As Barbara would say, one strong outburst of anger can linger two weeks in the aura, two weeks, one anger outburst. So you really know you had a anger, you know, you really let, let it into somebody, you know, okay, I probably have some of that vitiated red. I, I don't really actually want to see it, <laughs> right, right. but it's there then you have to work to release it. And actually, the, the real magic when we started writing the book was we realized, okay, of course it's on the aura, but what it's really about is it's a meditation book on changing the aura. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing we live in, why that book is so thick, is it's all these ways that you can meditate with the energy. You can call on the power and work to change your life. I'll give you a very quick example. One of our students in our classes, he was a doctor. And we give assignments, you know, in the class, like, what would you like to change in your life? What would you like to improve? So he said, well, you know what? I have a, I think I don't show enough care to my patients. I see a lot of patients every day. It's kind of in and out. And I don't really, you know, and it's true, right? Don't a lot of doctors treat patients like Petri dishes, right? <laughs> and people. So he had to work with the compassion to realize these are not Petri dishes. These are people. And they are people. They are not science experiments. They are people and so he did that now he brought the energies in but then he had to be more compassionate which he was by the end of the course he came back and said oh my god not only are my patients loving this what, what's happened to me but my practice has gotten even busier so this is how we, we have to apply this you know if you look at any spiritual tradition in the world it all comes down to conduct of living right we got to live our truth and another beautiful thing about the aura is it doesn't lie whatever's really going on with you is going to show up in that auric field. So if you're uh, for the, for our viewers and our listeners, and maybe they can't see their aura, which would be most people, and they want to change their aura to make it raise the frequency as high as possible and bring in the right colors. What, how do they, how do they get involved in this process where they can um, be able to get some type of change that they know, okay, I've improved my aura. I mean, is there any check-in points well, there? It, well, you're going to change in your life. Mm -hmm. So again, the aura is a reflection. What's So the reason we call it change your aura, change your life is that to generate any expression in the outer world, that energy has to be in your aura first. You have to have that power in your aura first then by divine law, it will show up in your life. So if you're looking at your life right now, we ask people to take kind of an inventory of themselves, you know, okay, I'm happy with this. I'm happy. That I'm not so happy with this. So the things you've accomplished were not accidental. You made them happen. You know, Barbara worked with a lot of the famous celebrities in the golden age, including like Cecil B. DeMille, Bob Hope. Lucille. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? And she said, you know, it wasn't an accident. They were successful. There was this energy in their aura that helped them be successful. It didn't make them perfect, but it wasn't accidental. So if you're seeing something in your life you're not happy with, then realize I can do something about that. I can Maybe there's a little weak link in my auric energy. If I strengthen it here, it will start to show up there. You know, when I, when I first started with Barb, I was still in the showbiz world. And, um, you know, that business is very feast or famine. And I was kind of in a famine moment. <laughs> um, uh, but she one day in her casual way, she always kind of worked like she looked at my heart chakra. This is a, ch a chakra in the middle of the chest. We also call it the hermetic center. This is the energetic nucleus of all your outer world activity, relationships, mm -hmm. career, finances, they're making an energetic connection right here. So she saw this energy of prosperity, it looks like a turquoise light. So oh, there's a lot of turquoise there. Now, at that moment, there wasn't, you know, the manifestation of it. But literally two weeks later, I got the most lucrative offer in the in the business up to that point. So 
you're in the key here is that you want to be in control of your life are you do you want to be the victim of your life or do you want to be the master of your life every time you say the problem's out there the problem is this the pro you're victimizing yourself so stop doing that and start saying okay i may not be able to change everything in the world but i'm going to change the things in my life that i want to see differently and i'm going to stick with it till it happens you know gandhi said be the change you want to see in the world so a lot of people are probably so it sounds like um you the way you change your life is you work with your aura it doesn't matter if you can see it or not not but if you're doing the auric exercises and you're working with divine light to work through your aura that will fuel the changes the positive right. changes into right. your life correct exactly but then you also have to act on it you can't just meditate and think only by itself it's going to change you have to do something so we say there's three keys in our meditative practice okay. decide what you want the light to do in other words okay like that doctor i'm going to work on compassion so there's an intention even before you meditate then the second thing is to go through the meditative process to call in the powers of love the divine powers of love that's key two and then key three employ that power in your life then it becomes a part of your auric field so another thing we would say i mentioned if you had the spiritual calling please answer it the other things we would encourage if you're not doing it right now is meditate we encourage daily meditation consistent and meditation is not like walking on the beach that's wonderful to do meditation is being alert still you're going inside to the inner divine life to try to connect with it and build up that power in you i've been doing this light meditation for 40 years now i can't live without it and it only gets better now how many things in your life that you do for 40 years get better as you're doing it you know yeah you know. absolutely amazing my special guest Dimitri Moriadis, we're talking about Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, the 25th anniversary of this seminal book about working with your aura to change your life. So a lot of people, you know, auras have colors and uh, people also are familiar with the word chakra when yeah. chakras in different areas of your body moving up vertically from your root to your crown have different colors also. What is the relationship between auras and chakras? Yes, well, if the aura is the first place you make changes in your life, the chakras are the first place you make changes in your aura. So these are like, we call them, we tend to call, use the word chakras, of course, the Sanskrit, the Indian word. We tend to use the word and simply energy center. These energy centers in the, in the body, they're receiving and transmitting stations of light. They're also levels of consciousness. There are the seven that you mentioned, but we work a great deal with four of them because there is so much receiving and transmitting of power for example, in the middle of the forehead, there is the mental center, separate from the third eye, the mental center, that's the energetic nucleus of your thinking. Right now, what you're thinking is radiating in energy, corresponding there. Obviously, we want that thinking elevated. The throat center here, it's not just words that come out of our, our mouth. There is a vibration. Be careful your intention of what you're speaking, because that's going out in energy. Then in the heart, as I mentioned, there is the world affairs, the activities of our life. Then there's a very interesting one people don't talk enough about. By the navel, there's, a, there's an emotional center. This is the energetic nucleus of your feeling nature. Your mind is here, but your emotional power is down here. They're two re very related, but completely separate parts of your auric anatomy. Can you... Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. When you want the light... To, I'm sorry, just to follow. You want the light to flow through all four of these... To kind of enhance everything because again you may want to change something in your life like your job but you're very upset about it so you got to clear out that emotional energy right the emotions have to be the emotions are your engine of action mm -hmm. so you want your emotions moving in a way they're going to propel you in the things you want to do now uh in meditation i i am a practitioner now of tm through the uh spiritual center in uh, encinitas where your organization is located and uh you know we call in the mantra during the meditation and kind of slips us in and out of this deep pool of pure consciousness and that's about it how does that uh intersect with uh your mention of meditation with an intention right well there's different forms of meditation right um there's there's multiple practices and each one kind of accommodates sort of what the person is looking for in their life. My God, just think of it now. There's even meditation apps. Could you have imagined that <laughs> 10 years ago, right? <laughs> so our meditation is actually what's called a meditative prayer. It's a combination of prayer and meditation. So 
prayer is the petitioning of the divine. So we actually verbalize. It's now a mantra. You're repeating a, a, a you know a set of words, but in this meditation, you're essentially saying a prayer. I request that you downray to me the deep rose pink ray of spiritual love. Then meditation is the act of receiving. Now intention meaning it's very specific. So for example, because our aura is so multifaceted. You've got parts of your aura that are in great shape, but you've got some other parts that are not in so great shape. So let's say again, let's say I know I got angry. Well, you can really focus the light to release that particular anger, or if it's sadness, or if it's grief, or if it's frustration, whatever it is. What I like about this is it's 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 like a it's like you're a painter and you've got a a palette of colors to work from. Now, yes, there is a learning curve. You have to learn how to do this. So I say it's a little bit like if you want to be a pianist, you got to practice your scales, you got to practice your arpeggios. You can't just sit down and play the concertos. And and when I started with Barbara, because there were no books or audio, she was the drill sergeant. She had us practice bringing down the light, do the verbalizations until we just got really good at it. And what happens is you, as you know, probably as a meditator, you're okay, you start meditating, you're kind of doing this. But then at some point, it's like something else starts to take over and you are in this different space. And that's the, that's the magic, right? You want to be kind of a different state of consciousness when you end your meditation than when you started it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, do, do animals and plants and the ocean, everything, everything has this energetic imprint, I guess. Everything has an aura, correct? And, and by the way, animals have delightful auras, not nearly as expansive as a human, which tells you even though we share a lot of biology with the animals, uh, spiritually speaking, we're in a completely different kingdom than in the animal kingdom. They are not as developed as we are. And as a matter of fact, they look up to us, not just for hugs and kisses and food at night, <laughs> you know, but they're kind of looking up to us for evolution. When we're, when we're loving an animal, let's say a pet, we're literally helping the soul in that animal body in its evolutionary process. So in a sense, we have a responsibility there to act in a way that helps the lower kingdoms of nature. That's really what's meant in the Bible by dominion over the earth. It didn't mean to do whatever you want with the planet. Right. And then you actually have the most responsibility to help the lower kingdoms. That's a great point. Uh, you mentioned a book because I think for our uh, audience, we wanna give them some tangible things that they can really start to work with as a, at once they get to your book. So you mentioned six steps to changing your aura. So can we, can you take everybody yeah. through kind of, so how do we the, get started with that? Three keys, okay. okay. Decide what you want the light to do, bring the light in your aura, apply it in your life. But when it bring it into your aura, there's six steps to bring the light into your aura. Okay. So now the first one is to relax. <laughs> You can't meditate if you're pissed off or if like, okay, I'm driving 50 miles an hour. I just stop for a second. I'm meditating. You know, you need to kind of, <laughs> you need to downshift from the activities of life a little bit and give yourself space to meditate. Now, I don't mean, again, you have to be in isolation, isolation, but it has to be, you know, actually I do have certain areas of the house where I do a lot of meditating. Um, then step two is and you can also listen to music or maybe sing the ohms or whatever whatever helps you just kind of decompress a little bit right uh then step two is you put this protective light around you because a spiritual protection when you're meditating you're opening to receive and not all the energies around you are so wonderful so you put the golden bubble of protection around you <clears throat> then third we call it checking the spiritual center so these chakras and i'm mentioning now especially the four they're not just they're not stationary they're actually in motion right they're moving and they're rotating like a planet and when things are moving well they're rotating in this clockwise motion from right to left if they're going counterclockwise it means there's a problem with that chakra so meaning or a problem in that part of your life so let's say in the heart chakra if it's moving clockwise i'm handling things okay but if it's moving counterclockwise there's something i'm doing wrong I've got to pay attention to it. So by asking the light to go into the chakras to help get them aligned and moving clockwise, the light can come in easier. So that's step three. Then step four, and this is one of the most magical because we actually call the formal name of this meditation is the higher self meditation. 
because what's happening is you are raising your consciousness into a chakra point about two feet above your head, meaning you're putting your attention in this eighth chakra called the higher self point. And that's where you're connecting with the higher. The meeting of the minds with the divine is not here, it's up there. Because then it doesn't matter if you've had your best day or your worst day on earth. When you're going up to that higher nature, you're in a different state of mind, right? We, we talked like Moses before the burning bush. What was the first thing the divine said to Moses? Take your shoes off. The ground on which you stand is holy. Shoes is earth understanding. Feet is earth power. Let go your problem. Let go your issue. You're standing on sacred ground right now. That's what we have to do. We have we go to the divine to be with the divine, not to ask not a genie for the magic wand that just automatically change everything. So we make that connection with the higher. That's step four. Then five, then we do the meditative prayers. Then we bring the energies in, and you can do one after the other. Uh, whichever, again, whatever you've decided you're going to work on, you know, whatever you think is your, your need at the moment. And then that's really the, the, the first four happen pretty quick. This is where you're really spending the bulk of your energy is this bringing in the light. Um, and then finally, when you're done, step six is grounding. You, you don't want to stay up there. You bring your consciousness back down. And then you also let the light equalize a little. Take a moment, because even though you may have finished your meditation, doesn't mean they have finished sending you the light. And then go out and be the heroic person. Do do good stuff. You know, make, bring that light into life. And then that's the process. It seems like a lot of folks have trouble with uh, meditation. Uh, and I agree with you. Meditation is the key to doing the spiritual work. That a, a lot of folks get stuck because they can't slow their minds down right and um right. talk to us about yeah. that because that's a problem for a lot of people once you get over it you're over it but exactly. a lot of people never get past that point because they're just they're they're in that constant reactive mode and it's very difficult for them especially especially in our uh, media driven world and with social media particularly and scrolling and every you get up and you <laughs> boom i mean i i make it a practice i do my tm two 20 minute sessions uh and i like don't go to the phone. I wake up, I get up earlier enough to do my meditation before I do anything else. I know, click, I got that check mark. I got one done for the day. That's what, the way to start. You start mm -hmm. with the divine. You don't start with, with this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I love this thing. I use it a lot, but you of don't course. start with <laughs> the know. phone. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, the two biggest things people tell us about meditating is number one, I don't have time to meditate or I can't concentrate. With the time, we like to say, well, wait a minute. If, if meditating is your one-on-one -on -one time with the divine, are you saying you don't have time for God? <laughs> you don't have time for the divine. So make the time. If something's important to you, you make the time. That's true. We had another lady, she was a doctor, single mom, full practice, raising two young children. She said, what do I do? I'm at the office all day going 50 miles an hour. I go home, the kids are all over me. When am I going to meditate? Well, she really wanted it. So what did she do? She left the house a half hour early. Mm -hmm. She sat in her car. She meditated there. And then she went to the office. Now, that wasn't forever, but that was during this time. It was a priority. If something's important to you, you will make the time for it. So just make the time. You're in control of your life, not your life in control of you. As far as concentration, we have to remember the mind is like a muscle. All right. Some people have really trained their mind, others not as much. If you haven't trained your mind to be able to control it, because you need, just like you need to be in control of your life, you need to begin to control of your thinking, then just practice, practice, practice. You know, there's even concentration apps on our phones right now. So leave the time, say, okay, I'm going to leave a half hour every morning. Now, maybe in the beginning, yes, I'm not concentrating very well, but I've, I've created the space. And then there's actually an energy of concentration that comes through as a lemon yellow ray. I would meditate with that to get the mind focused. It's just like if I went to the gym and I can't lift more than 50 pounds. Oh, gosh, I'm not very, very strong right now. I don't want to give up. Just That's just where my muscles are right now. Now, I'm not going to try to suddenly lift 200 pounds overnight. But slowly, as I keep going, I'll do more. So slowly, as you get this, your mind gets stronger. I'll make one quick point here on that. I remember as a, as a junior high, 
this champion chess player came to our house. He was blind. He could not see. And they showed the, the, the board on the, on the wall, a projection. He played a game with us there. In his mind, he had trained himself not only to be able to see the chess board, <laughs> to know where the moves are, and then to make decisions how to move. That's all through powers of concentration. Yeah. And you're telling me you can't focus a half hour in meditation. That's it's amazing. a matter of will. It's a matter of training yourself to do that. Don't give up. Stick with it. And when you do, you will be so pleased because as you focus your mind, then you'll feel all these other things just dropping away and you're going to feel so much better because you're kind of freeing yourself and then you'll have a better perspective when you do have to make those decisions rather than be so constantly immersed in it all the time. You know, spirituality is, I, I find it kind of in the same camp that it's not necessarily easy and when you start to develop spiritually, it's it's math. It, to me, it's like almost like mathematic in a way. And also, it's not that easy. And also, um, you're going to run into some issues along the way. One of them I, I mentioned earlier, which is you start to think like, oh, I got this and other people may not have it. But it comes with a whole bunch of stuff, responsibilities with it. Yeah. Yet the payoff is is amazing once you start to let go and witness and be present and not be judging and really strengthen your connection with the with the divine. Talk to us about the overall. Uh, well, uh, you you just said it. You, you just said it. You know, this is not the. If you're looking for the quick and easy road, you're in the wrong business. If you're looking for the most fulfilling thing you'll ever do in your life, you're in the right business. Mm -hmm. Anything worthwhile doesn't just come easy. You've got to put the effort in it. And some days it will feel kind of smooth. Others, there'll be rough moments. But you know, there's nothing better than when you've overcome an obstacle or a challenge. And you know, I really overcame that. I really, I really struggled with it, but I also really resolved it. It's this feeling of tremendous empowerment that you really have the ability to make these changes. The, a lot of this is discouragement. There's a lot of pessimism right now in the world. A lot of like, oh, the world's falling apart. That's not the way the higher sees it at all. Don't fall into that gloom and doom crap. You have the power to change your life and make the things happen, but you've just got to use the power in your hand. You know, sometimes Barbara would do a reading and she'd see these beautiful energies and the person had these issues is, well, obviously you're not using the power you have. You're shortchanging yourself. You have, it's like you have more money in the bank account than you think. Mm -hmm. But you've got to employ it. It's not going to just happen by itself. So be, what do they say? Fortune favors the bold. So take a chance, all right? It's okay to, to, to fail this time. Failure today is success tomorrow. Now, as, as over the years, as you've uh, delved into, you had your spiritual awakening, you've delved into a deep, consistent spiritual practice. Um, what, what has happened to you as an individual? And also, can you now uh, see or as more than you did when you began? Well, I, I can't tell you all. I mean, every part of my life. I mean, this I've been at 40 years. Mm -hmm. So now I have to say there's also, all right, I want to be clear here. You know, having a, my in my case, this is my case, the awakening wasn't only a personal thing. It became eventually, not right away, a professional thing. Now, not everybody that has their awakened all this is like meant to be in metaphysics, okay? You can have enlightened accountants, enlightened lawyers, enlightened, doc, you know, sure. you could be whatever goal. But in my case, and even Barbara didn't kind of share this with me right away because I didn't think of it that way. I didn't realize she was eventually preparing me to teach, okay? Now, this was a long journey to get there, but every part of my life has been transformed. I am in a sense, now again, the path was not easy. And there were many twists and turns, and I made some mistakes along the way, like anybody did. So we're not talking about being suddenly perfect. But the person I am today, I can't imagine having reached this without taking the path that I took. I could have taken the easier road, you know, had a, maybe a cushier life, shall we call it that. But I wouldn't have been the person that I am. And I certainly would not be able to help others now in their spiritual journey. And of course, the inner gifts do start to awaken, but they awaken kind of naturally in their own pace. My connection with the higher is far deeper than it ever was before, but that was also a very gradual process that happened over time. Uh, I, I'm, I caution anybody that says, oh, here's five easy, easy steps to enlightenment, you know, run the other <laughs> way. <laughs> That's what we get on Instagram, though, right? Well, that's what they want. <laughs> the word's right there, Insta, right? 
Here's your spiritual hack for the day, right? Spiritual hack, yeah, exactly. That's the danger of this fast-paced stuff. Now, there's an upside, of course, that the knowledge right now, you know, this is an age where we have to discern more than ever before. If there was ever a time for discerning truth, it's today. If falsehoods can travel the internet six times faster than truth, it means we have to be more discerning, use that intelligence more than ever before, and, and don't just rely on, on what the crowd is saying. Do your own objective research because there's more knowledge available than ever before, but there's also more, excuse me, crap available mm -hmm. than ever before. And you know, Barbara predicted this too. She said, we're kind of right now at the society. She said this years ago and it's still there. We're a little bit of what they call the tail end of the scorpion. We're at the, we're at the end of one period of evolutionary life and we're at the beginning of another. But before the other can start, the old has to be exhumed. And she described it like, okay, let's say there's an arm and it. it's really infected and it's got all this pus. And well, sometimes you got to lance it. The pus has got to come out and then you dress the wound. And unfortunately, we're still a little bit in that pus releasing stage. So when you see these terrible things happening, of course, do what you can to change it, but don't let it let you fall into despair as far as what's the potential for the earth and the planet and humanity. That's a, that's a great insight. Um, just on a day-to-day -day basis and something that's fun, can the colors we wear with our clothing, can that Absolutely. impact the, the change in that. our aura? Barbara used to work with fashion designers on that. Absolutely. If you're feeling a little, you know, oh, I don't know, I'm so tired today, put on something bright, put on a red, put on, I know orange isn't a great color to wear, but it's actually great for your auric field. So absolutely, if you use energies that are more in alignment with the what we call the enlightened colors, they have a positive effect on your life, absolutely, and your auric field. What would be some of those to consider? Well, um, they are the brighter colors. Now, you can find muted ones, but, you know, for example, the reds, the green, the, like the emerald green, uh, the blues, like the sapphire blues and the or the powder blues, uh, uh, the turqu wear turquoise, if you're looking, even, even a turquoise ring, you know, wear turquoise, which is a great color for prosperity and just kind of an optimistic outlook on life. Now, I know, look, I came from the Midwest here. You do want to kind of avoid some of what Barbara would call the drab colors, mm -hmm. uh, the, the cocoa browns, the grays, the blacks. I know black is very chic. And her joke is, uh, don't buy a car from someone wearing avocado green. They're going to try to cheat you. you know? wow. okay. <laughs> avocado green is a color of deceit in the aura. So I don't mean, you know, completely purge your 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 closet, but if you go in your closet and everything's black, you got to get some color in there, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, you just disappointed New York City, so. Anyway. I know. <laughs> so the name of the book, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, a step-by-step -step guide to unfolding your spiritual uh, your spiritual power and a fantastic conversation, Dimitri Mariatis, um, really because we're using the aura to change our life, not changing our aura for the sake of changing our aura, or it becomes an instrument. So thank you so much for articulating that. Everybody check out this book. It is a seminal book on auras. You're doing great work, Dimitri. Carry on. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for all the wonderful work you've done. And um, thank you for being on Guys Guys Radio. And please tell everybody where they can find out more about your work and get the book. Oh, yes. Well, we're here, in, as you said, in Encinitas, but we're also online, spiritualarts.org. We have classes online, workshops, books, and the Institute of Spiritual Arts Institute. Fantastic. Thanks for coming back to the show. Always a pleasure to see you, Dimitri. Bye -bye. Appreciate Bye -bye. you. Thank you for all the good work you're doing. Thank you. If you enjoy the guests and content I bring you each and every week to Guys Guys TV and Guys Guys Radio, please support us by subscribing to our channels and platforms. Thank you.